Are we alone in the universe? It's a question that's captivated humanity throughout the ages. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains at least 100 billion stars, some of which, like our own star, the Sun, have planets. Multiply that 100 billion by at least 100 billion galaxies that make up the universe. Is Earth the only planet currently populated with advanced forms of life? Did advanced life forms exist in the past? How did life originate on Earth? A potato-sized meteorite found in 1984 in Antarctica named ALH84001 may have answers. Scientists decided that the meteorite came from Mars because it matched the red planet's chemical composition. Most likely, it was a remnant of some ancient Martian explosion that Earth's gravitational pull sucked out of space. The American Chemical Society 2010 Priestley medalist Richard N. Zare was on the scientific team that helped reignite a centuries-old debate over the existence of life on Mars. Inside the 4.5 billion-year-old meteorite, they detected possible fossilized remains of a bacteria-like life form. The rock was a meteorite, a meteorite that fell in Antarctica and was identified to have come from Mars based on various isotopic signatures. You, you can't be certain, but because we had sent the Viking lander to Mars in the 70s, we had some idea what Mars looked like, and that allowed us to say this rock came likely from Mars. It is rare indeed for scientific research to affect the everyday lives of millions of people in this way. To fascinate, to enchant, to captivate. The research by this ACS Priestley medalist and his colleagues was science, and it was magical. For inside a sliver of that meteorite, the scientists detected what could be evidence for extraterrestrial life. We speculated the possibility that they were the remnants of some primitive life that had been on Mars. We were able, again, with isotopes that date this to about 3.6 billion years ago, and that led to a speculation that maybe we were looking at a very primitive life that had existed on Mars long ago when it cooled off. The conclusions had far-ranging implications. Are we alone in the universe? Maybe not. But Dr. Zayer's research touched even deeper reaches of the human psyche. How did life start? What's the origin of life? We have good evidence that long ago, the Earth was basically a molten mass and there was no life. And it cooled off and then it got hit in the head with all types of bombardments of things that came in. It may well have brought in organic matter. Somewhere we went from non-life to life. Now, various people have other explanations for this, and I'm not try trying to go towards the religious end, but I'm trying to give it a scientific sense, because we don't know the answer, and we're very interested in, the, in exploring this question. Did life come first from Mars and then to Earth? What a wild idea. We'd all be Martians if that were true. Uh, does life start anywhere? Is life really a fluke, a really uh, unlikely event that's happened? How did it happen? We're still questing after that, and I think that's a very important chemical question, one that I think excites everyone. DNA. It's the book of life. These incredible strands contain the recipe for all of life on Earth. DNA plays a key role in determining whether we are healthy or sick. In 2003, scientists reached a milestone in unraveling its mysteries by completing the Human Genome Project. It involved the identification of about 25,000 genes and the sequencing of almost 3 million chemical base pairs that make up our DNA. This landmark achievement promises to revolutionize medicine by providing us with new ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat diseases. Very few people know that this achievement was possible because of technology developed by ACS Priestley medalist Richard N. Zare. The technique was a laser-induced fluorescence method. It involves shooting a laser beam into a substance and measuring the pattern of light emitted. This helps scientists identify substances based on their chemical signature in much the same way that the whirls and curves in a person's fingerprints identify an individual. 
Uh, I am the person who first thought up the idea of using laser to excite molecules so that they would fluoresce as a way of detecting them. This has allowed us to study all types of things, particularly it leads even to the ability to look at single molecules in solution. This has opened up all types of possibilities. The, we're not the first to look at single molecules, but I think we are the first to look at single molecules in solution. This laser-induced fluorescence gives us a signal, a bright signal against a dark background. And that is so good that we're able to see individual molecules. Now that's a dream. When I was a graduate student, we prided ourselves that no one had seen a molecule, but we all believed in them. But uh, that has changed, not only with various scanning, tunneling micros microscopy, but with the ability of the laser to excite fluorescence in molecules. Uh, Laser-induced fluorescence has many practical applications. You can use it to prospect for oil. Planes can fly over the ocean and look to find out where oil rises, uh, and therefore has the possibility of discovering the oil under the uh, ocean. Uh, that's just one example. Fluorescence measurements are used in so many different ways to understand nature of the atmosphere, which helps us to know something about the possibilities of climate change that are being produced. Uh, so you, you find it being used in many different contexts. It's now become very much a general technique. Whether battling the flu or fighting cancer, the medicines we take can be lifesavers. Today's medicines, for instance, may not reach the parts of the body where they're most needed. While treating disease, they may harm healthy tissue as well. And sometimes they have unwanted and dangerous side effects. A new generation of medicines made out of nanoparticles may help avoid or reduce these problems. Nanoparticles are barely one fifty thousandth of the width of a human hair. ACS Priestley medalist Richard N. Zare is doing research that can help move nanomedicines out of the laboratory and into home medicine cabinets. Another area which is in its infancy is using nanoparticles as a form of drug delivery. And I've been very in involved in my lab uh, with uh, Dr. Gunilla Jacobson to take a drug, put the drug into a, a common solvent that's a small molecule, and squirt this mixture into supercritical carbon dioxide. This wonderful supercritical carbon dioxide has the ability to dissolve small organic solvents, but not large organic molecules. And the large organic molecules precipitate and rain out as small nanoparticles. What we've been doing with that is embedding the nanoparticles into polymers. We actually make a polymer mix, and these polymers are biodegradable, so they can be put into the body and then release the drug over a long period of time. We've shown releases that go over more than 40 days. This is important for many treatments because often a treatment has to be repeated in medicine, whereas if we can do this the right way, once put in, it stays in and, and keeps giving out for a long time. There'll be many possible uses of this. And I'm not the only one who is fascinated at all by, and sees the opportunity of drug delivery through nanoparticles.